memories. How many lost stories of those first days. seasons, the resting place of the dead have a sameness to them, a sense of order and place, reminders of the cycle of life, death and rebirth. Who were these souls? How did they live? What did they think? Why did they come to this new land? Who were these people? How inadequate these few words. Born, when? Died in 1898. When men were seeking gold in the Klondike, a Ukrainian immigrant found his final resting place in the soil he had come to claim as his own. Crosses. Shapes and forms from ancient cultures. Some maintained others left to survive as best they can. Crosses. Some built to last to the end of time. None to speak of these people's bold dreams. A silenced bell, abandoned and rusting. Never to ring out the joy of a wedding or the mournful toll of a funeral, like the people who brought it here, lying quietly in the fields. Easter is a special time to renew one's faith, to celebrate the arrival of spring, a link between the ancient folk traditions and the edicts of the church. Ukrainian customs living in the new land, brought to Canada by the pioneers, and now a vital part of the life of their children, bonds across the generations, a time of great joy and happiness. The place of the dead becomes a place of life for those who truly believe the dead are present and happy. A time, too, for sharing. The spirits are here, and they, too, share in the bounty of the new land. The delight of sharing and tasting the best of the kitchen and the fields, exchanging with your kinfolk the favorite seasonal foods and those prepared with your own hands. are a vital part of the fabric of the nation. But for the children of the pioneers, acceptance was hard won. For the first immigrants, life in the new land was fraught with uncertainty. Canadians saw the Ukrainians and their customs as quaint and amusing. Their clothes, their language, their food habits, the practice of eating garlic was to make them the butt of many cruel jokes. Out of the hills and valleys of Ukraine came the wealth of farmers and small landholders needed to fill the western plains. Ukrainians were anxious to leave. Some were persecuted by waves of invaders. Others feared for their sons. Some were taxed heavily. But most simply wanted some guarantee that there would be land. Land to pass on to their sons and their sons after them. The stories of Canada were almost too good to be true. Freedom, free land, 160 acres, jobs for everyone, high salaries, no bureaucrats, and soil so rich you could grow a crop in 90 days. All you had to do was get there, and the land was yours for the taking. To buy their tickets, many Ukrainians sold their possessions, and then began the long journey. 10 days by foot and wagon to the railroad, 
Another week by train to the harbor cities and the ships. Almost a month of those ships, often cattle ships, crossing the North Atlantic. At last, Canada. Confusing lineups and regulations, questions to be answered, humiliating medical inspections. Arrival in Canada did not mean the end of travel. Their destination was Manitoba, more than a thousand miles by rail. Their arrival caused much speculation among Canadian settlers. What language did they speak? Who were they anyway? Austrians? Galicians? Ruthenians? Bakowinians? For most Canadians, it was just too confusing. They simply called them Bohunks and told them to speak white, meaning English. For some, the confusion in national identity would mean being branded enemy aliens and internment when new and old lands went to war in 1914. While they sat in prison camps, other Ukrainians won victories for Canada in the trenches of the Western Front and received the nation's highest awards for valor. To the newspapers, ranchers and industrial owners, they were raw material, laborers to settle the land and buy the products of the factories. The immigration sheds in Winnipeg, crowded, segregated by class, were the first homes for most of the pioneers. But for some, there was no room. Their moments of quiet despair are known only to themselves. Yet, in those confusing first days, there were beautiful moments of humanity, people transcending barriers with a smile and touching of hands. Those who came as children have vivid memories of their early days. They arrived in the springtime, the sights and smells of the first spring in the new land vividly recalled decades later. Spring is a special time. In that cold spring of 1898, 42 Ukrainian children died. Victims of the cold, official indifference, unpreparedness, and an unawareness of the new land. 42 souls lost as so many others in the settling of this land.
The child of today has very little awareness of the hardships faced by his parents and grandparents who came here as children. My parents came here on the road, to the I was to be in a family there three years. Three years I was to be a На коле приїхав, прийшов роботи на як то се інар, се піяр, на, на треку робити. І я робив на тих на секціях, на генниках, і так я робив ще три роки. А по трьох роках я вже приходив додому і робив вже ту, що було допомагати їм на гомштаті. Ми взяли фарму. І ми там прийшли до голови, а там не було нічого, але ж ломи, каміння, таке вовто. Не було зім'я, ніякої корчі, дороги, не було, ні, нічого не було. Мусили корчувати, мусили так копати і збирати. І, і не було чим орати, і не було за що купити, і не було. Так, от, така історія моя. Я приїхала, мало 12 років я мала, як я приїхала. Я приїхала з родичами. То ми мусили будувати хату oh. і тяжко бідали. Бо приїхали до кемпи, затикали діри, аби сніг не літю. А звідти тато брали фарму і носили їсти татове. Та й так, то босими ногами, але мама моя ще тішила, що досить дров є, чим палити. There was more than enough wood. The settlers quickly discovered that their homestead of 160 acres of land was all too often in the midst of dense bushland. Those few who had survey lines cut through the forest were considered lucky. Dropped off in the middle of nowhere, the homesteader found it necessary to fend totally for himself. Там нас скинув, туди ж зачав крапати. І так зігнули корчі, поклали в реню, таку кусце там сердак. Та й мама з моїм братом на лише шишкнегі. Та й вони там дощ паде, стоїть вереня, а мама плаче. Та я собі думаю, що вони не сварилися, я не вижу, бо щось їх боле. Their first homes had to be hastily constructed shelters. Little time could be spent on improvements. Men needed to find work to pay off their debts or to arrange for the passage of their family who were still in the old country. Some of those who labored so hard in those first difficult days are still able to recall the early times. I came to the seventh year. I had 17 years old when I came to Canada. I went to work in the brand of the fuel gunner. I had water. I was not able to do it, but I had water for water boy boy. Я там робив кілька місяців, так приїхав назад до Венепегу. А з Венепегу то я робив коло сури копав вже, і коло, е, коло пресер в мене мішав, граб мішав, і він досив на цеглу, на великі будинки. А так я всілякі роботи робив. Seasonal employment as laborers provided the badly needed cash income. The branch lines of the West were built with Ukrainian hands and backs. Section men, track layers, spike pounders, weed cutters, all the tough work. As the season drew to a close, men were laid off. Men who returned to their homesteads often cut cordwood to provide a small cash supplement. by four by eight feet would bring in 75 cents to a dollar and a quarter. A good man could cut one or two cords during the short winter day. No one would get rich, but one could survive. The toughest work was often done with the simplest of tools. Hands did the job, strong hands and an iron will. In many instances, the immigration agencies and the Department of the Interior were totally unprepared for the influx of settlers, 
and all too often they were left to their own devices in strange environments. Nevertheless, the land was cleared, hundreds of thousands of acres. Few could afford a horse. The most common beast of burden was the family cow or oxen. The Ukrainian pioneers spread and developed the use of early maturing crops, which revolutionized the wheat industry in the whole nation. Again, it was hands that did the job in those early days, flailing, winnowing, milling. But it was worth it, for the end product was the staff of life, bread. Ukrainians were quick to adopt the latest improvements in agricultural techniques, and as the farmers prospered, they soon had horse-drawn binders and reapers, the newest and most modern equipment of the time. farmer built a windmill, a sentinel, testimony to the changing times, a reminder of the ingenuity and skill of the pioneers. Not all the past accomplishments are forgotten. Today's generation has made the time to remember and restore facets of the early days. a sign of better times and prosperity, testimony to the rich folk arts of the people. Now, with time and a newly awakened awareness to do such things, these are preserved to demonstrate the lifestyles of the past. In the middle of the forest, a living museum has been built with the skillful hands of one woman, determined to live alone in the old style. flowers and rich gardens are two identifiable characteristics of the Ukrainian home and farm. Each family made itself self-sufficient in terms of vegetables and preserved them for the long winter months. Why are Ukrainians so fond of flowers? No, I was so small, I loved it, and I think that Ukrainians love it. 
всі українці любить, хіба такі, що не хочуть вже працювати коло того. Це файно виглядає. Так мені ще здається, що я це є так, як любов. Люблю квітки, так. Мені ще здається, що веселіше коло хати навіть. То не можна сидіти, бо що створив чоловіка, щоб він працював, аби він не лежав на ліжкове і лише їв, але щоб він працював. The work ethic is imbued in the character of the people. Idleness is a sin to some. Success on the land meant bigger and better homes. Larger homes now sprung up. The first houses became tool sheds or chicken coops. Some even found time for their own publications. Prosperity was just around the corner. In contrast, interiors remained simple in form and style, yet in the starkness, a definite sense of beauty and warmth. In every home, the Bible and Kubzar, the poems of Taras Shovchenko are revered. It was Shovchenko who inspired his people to think, to read, to gain knowledge, learning from others, never rejecting their own. A pride in things Ukrainian, Embroidery, dancing, games, songs, all form a part of the process of making the culture and language a vital part of life. The quest for knowledge has always been an important part of the heritage of the people. Up to 1916, the schools were bilingual, Ukrainian and English. Even the hard-bitten Canadian school inspectors who called them Ruthenians were impressed with the Ukrainians' desire to learn. A special training school was set up to provide Ukrainian-speaking teachers for the predominantly Ukrainian areas. Schools, more than centers of learning, three-dimensional proof of success, built with freely donated labor. Some pioneer schools are still in use today, though modernized. Some stand abandoned. Some are used for other purposes. Barely a trace remains of still others. Nearby, the Cross of Freedom, to commemorate and give thanks for the safe journey to the new land and to witness the celebration of the first Ukrainian Mass in Canada. The first tiny wooden churches built by a cluster of settlers are seldom used now. At first, seen by Canadians as strange and foreign, the onion-shaped domes are now a familiar part of the Canadian landscape. Churches, big, small, pretentious, plain, all houses of God and examples of the faith of the people. Fascinating shapes, monuments in wood and metal to the presence of man on earth, memorials to our contributions, reminders of the skill of craftsmen, shapes with crosses and crescents to tell the story of the victory of Christianity over Islam. Life in the city or country revolved around the church and its activities. Moments of sadness and joy to be shared with one's countrymen. The tying together of people who were experiencing new and strange encounters in their adopted land. The churches were always more than mere buildings for services. They were the nerve center of the community, the social center, the educational center the place where language and customs were reinforced. In time, national homes and Prosvita halls became centers for some of the social activities. Still, the churches were the centers for the traditional folk and religious celebrations. The traditions of the past live on in today's ceremonies. Christmas Eve, time for that very important meatless supper, 12 courses, eaten with gusto after a day of fasting, Succulent dishes lovingly prepared, a continuation of ancient customs. 
Ukrainian Christmas carols have become a part of the customs of Canada and bring joy to all who hear them. The meal over, the family goes to church for midnight mass, the celebration of the birth of Christ. Easter, the death and rebirth of the Son of God, a time to bless the Easter baskets, the reenactment of centuries-old ceremonies, samples of important foodstuffs soon to be eaten and shared, the end of Lent and fasting. Some of the folk customs have become part of the mainstream of Canadian life at festive times. Easter would not be complete without the beautifully painted Ukrainian egg. Canada's National Ukrainian Festival at Dauphin is opened with the symbolic presentation of bread and salt, holy foods, remembered in the rituals of the Ukrainian Canadians. Bread, salt, and a sheaf of wheat are presented to the audience, again to make the link between the people and the soil. Festivals revive ancient court dances from the days of the Cossack state. The cymbale, a popular national instrument played traditionally by men. It is an instrument of joy and happiness. The lira plays the melancholy ballads of woe and sorrow. The land did not always welcome them these people who told their stories with song. They worked, they harvested, they prospered, they grew. The countryside blossomed with the communities they built. The names echoed across the fields. Some remember by living in the old ways. In retirement, a gentleman farmer. Way 
days changed, dreams changed, hopes changed. The cities beckoned, the young answered, but some stayed, the best of their time to hold and use. Those who dreamed and toiled recall the past, their swiftly flown youth. In their memories and thoughts, not the modern equipment of their children and grandchildren, but the chance to reflect, not only the past, but the present. The chance to quietly walk and think about the railroad line, now abandoned, they once helped build. By hand and tool, a chance to recreate the work and handicrafts and arts of the past. of dance, of song, of art. A time to remember, to reflect, to talk, to meet old friends. Doctor, lawyer, engineer, soldier, senator, farmer, professor, musician. From far and near they come, the Ukrainians, to spend some time, spin new dreams, to take the place of those already fulfilled. To think of those first people, marvel at what they've done, and secretly hope they can accomplish as much. The land is no longer so new. The small beginnings, now so remote. The horizons, now so broad. The seed has sprouted, the crop harvested, and re-sown, and re-sown. The people are many and proud. 